Hello everyone, my name is Guilherme and welcome to another Game Engine devlog video. And in this time, I decided that it is a great time to do an overview of everything, literally everything that we've done so far in terms of API. Because as I said, and if you're new here, um, this is Dynami, Dynami 2 to be more precisely. Um, and it's a game engine that I'm developing and I'm sharing all the process here. Um, doing those videos and I'm also releasing the source code of this first part of it on my Patreon. So if you're interested, uh, go ahead and check that out. And what is interesting is I do plan to make an editor for the engine, just like a uh, cave engine, just like any other um, game engines, you know. So this is cave engine, my, my 3D engine. Let me open a real project here just for a moment so you can see there's a fully integrated editor you can edit stuff you can write scripts let me see if i can quickly edit the script here and yes it's complete have everything you have and i do plan to do this for Genemy, but i also want to support uh, if you want oh by the way it's a great thing that i that was, i was working on anyways this is not the subject of this video, so let me close cave. I do support, uh, plan to um, allow you to use Dynami as a library. So that's why I'm releasing this on my Patreon as well. Not only for you to study and make your own, but if you want to use this as a library for your games, you can. So that means that this engine itself needs to be well documented and needs to have like a bunch of examples and so on. So I decided to make this video uh, to showcase the API for the engine as a library, as a C++ library uh, on its own. It's a 2D engine, as you can see. I'm thinking about changing this. We will see that in a moment, but yes. Um, and I will go ahead and do an overview. By the way, before the overview, uh, next step. What is the next steps uh, for the engine? I was saying in the, in the previous video, I mean, if you're following along the development, you will know, you know that uh, we do have Python scripting completely embedded and working. So this is an example here, uh, a very random example in the middle of a bunch of other stuff, but you get the point. Um, so Python scripting is supported here uh, in the engine. And I, I was talking about, hey, now I will work in the more core architectural things about like the concept of a game object and scenes and so on. Uh, I don't think I'll do that yet. And I'll explain that in a moment. Maybe <laughs> I'm, I'm still deciding or I will work in the editor part. And I'm also not think, uh, not sure about that because what I want to do, what I really want to do is like right now we do have the editor, the engine and the engine test, which is like the test unity stuff for the, uh, for the engine. What I want to do is create a folder here and start writing sample code, because again, I want to be able, I want you to be able to use the engine itself as a library. <clears throat> so what I believe it's going to be good is to have a bunch of sample projects like a flappy bird or an endless runner, or if you support 3d and this is something, <laughs> uh, maybe a 3D example or stuff like that. So I believe that it would be an interesting addition to add samples here with a bunch of different projects for you to download and get started. So this is probably what I'm going to do next, maybe a Flappy Bird, which is a very simple project that I can put together in an hour or stuff like that. Uh, so you can understand, better understand how to make games with it. Also, maybe a sample creating an entire game using Python, that would be very cool, right? <laughs> I believe that It'll be interesting. Um, so yeah, this is something uh, as well. So yeah, this is the next steps, okay? So now that we have this, let's go ahead and do an overview, like the overview that I was promising uh, since the beginning of this video, which is like, hey, this is the engine, this is the include, and this is everything that we need to know, right? So at the moment, let me minimize everything. The engine does have uh, inside the include directory, which is where you will actually do the stuff. You have all this six folders here. So you have audio, graphics, math, physics, scripting, and system. Uh, they are very well specific and well divided, meaning that each folder here clearly identifies and specifies what they are used for and the settings. For example, the audio, I will start by the audio because it's very simple. And the audio does not rely on the rest of the stuff to work. So you can simply create an audio device and start doing this stuff um, and import an audio file. And of course, it's meant to play audios, <laughs> as the name suggests. So the, the, the header file for the audio is very straightforward. There's a class called audio and you can create a default one 
with no data in it, just a sample rate that you can modify, by the way. And then you can manually add the data um, sample by sample here. Uh, it will always be stereo, just keep that in mind. Or you can go ahead and pass a file path that will load a f an audio file um, and then it will fill that for you with this data. So very handy here. We can also copy an existing audio and so on. So very simple, very straightforward class to playing audio, right? And then you have the audio device, which is the, the class you actually need in order to play a specific given audio, which is um, with the play function here. As you can see, play takes the audio, the amount of loops you wanna, want it to do, the volume and the pitch, and it will also return a handle as a size T for you to control this audio. And why do I mean? What do I mean about control? Well, once you play an audio, if you store the sample, you can later on access all those functions below here to do all sorts of changes to the audio being uh, currently being, being played. For example, you can check if the handle is valid, which is important. Then you can check if it's playing or pause, or you can set or get a paused state, meaning you can pause and unpause. And I do have uh, help fun functions for that. Uh, you can also see how many loops um, the audio have, as you can see here. Uh, and a loop is like, it played once and then it is playing twice or for the third or fourth time. So this is a loop. Um, no, actually, this is how many loops remaining, by the way. Um, this is the volume, the pitch, and the progress of the audio. Very simple, very straightforward. And this is the audio class. Let's move on now to the math. I would skip graphics for a moment because it will make sense. The math is very simple too. I have a vector two class and it does have x and y and a bunch of operations so we can perform assignment operations you can check if a vector is equal or different or less or greater than another vector you can add and subtract vectors or multiply and divide vectors by other vectors or scalars uh, you can also do this in place too um, so you have all the operations that you can expect to vectors. You can also print this vector using std code, which is very nice. You can use std code vector and it will print the vector in a very good format for you. Uh, and you do have vector operations such as dot product, lerp with another vector, length, normalize and distance to another vector. So very helpful vector class. And we also have the same thing for vector three. And I'm not going to uh, repeat myself, but we have x, y, and z. And the difference is that we have a third um, axis here. All the operations are present. And we also have all the, the, the methods for the vector. The difference is that vector three, you do have cross product projected to project a vector into another. And I believe that's it. This is the uh, have norm to. Um, so I believe that's it. We do have, yeah, those are the, 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 the new functions here for the vector, right? So very easy, very handy. Maybe I should add this other focus factor too. Anyways, <clears throat> I haven't, but there they are. And then we have the math tree, which is a matrix three by three class that we will have, again, um, nine values, three rows or three columns as you wish. And then it does have all the operations that you expect from the matrix. Not all, to be honest, we do have the main operations that you expect to do uh, game development, basic game development with matrices, so this is important. So we have transpose and inverse two, which is very important, determinant, you can also calculate that. We have an identity mat, uh, matrix here is as a static uh, const, which is good. We also have options to build a translation, a scale, or a rotation matrix given some data. And mat, mat, uh, mat three is for matrix, uh, for two. it's for 2D games. If we want to extend that for 3D games, I will have to implement vector four and mat four. So yeah, I'm thinking about that, maybe. <laughs> Anyways, so we also have math utils, which is a very useful thing. Um, I have a namespace here for math because they're, those are functions that are not exactly connected to anything. And it's just a bunch of, a collection of functions or, or a constant like uh, they are very handy for you to use. I'm not sure if... Yeah. Anyways, and then we have like map to array and map from array. This is a, just a YouTube function because I find I personally find a bit annoying to do the math here. Map like X and Y into a single one dimensional array and do like the other way around. So yeah, I have this. Um, I also have conversions to Euler or to Radians and I also have options to get a floor of a number or the ceiling of a number. Um, so you have, if you have like pi, for example, the floor of pi is three and the ceiling of pi is four, right? So this is floor and ceiling. You have square root, 
We also have uh, sine, cosine, and tangent calculations here, ready for you to use as a math you choose uh, functions, right? And last but not least, we do have transform. This transform is transform 2D. As you can see, we do not have support for 3D yet, but and maybe I'm I'm talking a little bit <laughs> too much here, but. Yes, yeah, so the transform is basically a collection of position, a scale, and a rotation. An advantage of using a transform class is that you can, of course, move this uh, in place and it will consider the rotation. So if you want to move forward, but the object is rotated, uh, the forward will, will take into account the, the rotation of the object and so on. So it's good to use this. And it also builds a matrix for you. And this matrix tricks is the model matrix that you can use to feed that into OpenGL in order to draw <clears throat> the, the model. So this is good, always good to have a transform when you are dealing with an object and so on. So this is the map. Um, let me close everything i do have a bunch of stuff open here i will close that later on it's fine but this is the math class right so that way we finish the another one are you jump the the system in graphics I'll, I'll talk about that last because they're like the more exciting thing so let me go ahead and, and quickly explore the physics um if you're making a game of course you want to do collision detection and collision resolution and luckily for you we do have we do provide some useful stuff for you to do that <laughs> so the first thing is that we have an align axis bounding box which is very handy for you to represent like the bounding box the 2d bounding box of certain entity for example uh let's say this for example this object uh it will probably have a bounding box like oops i can drag and drop this right like that meaning that it is the minimum bounding box it, it is the minimum like non-rotation non-rotated uh rectangle that will cover the entire area of the object stuff like that this is a bounding box this is a just a quick explanation of it um and this is used a lot when it comes to physics to do all sorts of easy and fast math so it's good to have a struct for them and you can construct with a minimal and a maximum position you can construct this from a mesh which is great you can also do this from a mesh and a transform so if the mesh is moved around uh it will take the the movement of the mesh into account when building this um you can build an aabb from a transform and a transform like it, it will basically consider the transform um a rectangle on its own if it's on scale rotation and position uh, from a matrix, which is basically the same as constructing from, from the transform, and then you can copy. So very simple stuff for physics. We also have a sphere struct, and a sphere is very straightforward. It does have a position in the world and a radius, and you can simply construct that very easy. And with that in mind, you have the collision detection and collision resolution functions here in the collision um header so you can see you can check collisions between aabb and other ABB, aabb aabb versus transform and aabb versus sphere so this is what you have for aabb but it's not everything because you can have collisions between a transform and another transform and a transform and a sphere and of course you have uh, aabb versus transform here it's just like the other way around so you have this too and you can also check collisions between sphere and sphere so you basically have i believe you have most of the collisions here like between transforms aabb and spheres so it's great to check if they they now collide um and before we go to the collision resolution functions we do have a bunch of other helpful functions here that probably belongs to math but i'm leaving them here as physics because it makes sense too to have them as physics anyways uh <laughs> let me know in the comments if you think that this definitely belongs to math or physics i don't know uh, I'm, I'm keeping them here as physics because i'm using some physics stuff like abb so that's it so so you know uh and maybe the abb is math too i don't know i i i like the the current separation that I have, so I'll probably keep it like that. But let me know in the comments, anyways, uh, where's the the best place to store these functions. So we have line versus sphere, intersection, line versus transform, line versus ABB, and line versus line. And what is this? Well, um, as the name probably suggests, let's take a look at line versus line. For example, if I have a line, this line, and then if I have this line, do they intersect? In this case, they don't. So this will re probably return some, uh, I don't remember, the, it will probably gonna return infinite, like the maximum number of the vector um, to say that they do not intersect. Uh, I can check this live too, but if they do intersect like this, it will return this position here. 
which is like, hey, the intersection was here, right? So yeah, this is basically what line versus line does. We have line versus sphere, as the name suggests, it to return a vector of intersections between this line here and the sphere right here. In this case, it's this one and this one, those two positions will be returned. Same for the transform and the ABB. So if I have an ABB, it will return a vector with the intersection. And if I have a transform like that, it will return a vector with the intersection. Very easy. Let, let's actually check live here. Yes, it will, will return float max if they do not intersect. So it's good to know. Uh, we also have functions to check if a point is inside something like an AABB, a transform or a sphere, because of course it does not make sense to have a point inside a line this does not exist there's no inside the line this may be on the line but this, uh, this is also very hard to, to calculate because of discretization computer discretization so yeah it's not a great idea to do this so that's why we have point inside line a uh, point inside abb transforming sphere right and last but not least we have collision resolution because well, now that you know, let's say you know that two shapes intersect. Now, how to collide with them? How to resolve this intersection? How to resolve the collision? Now we have these functions here that can resolve collisions between a transform and ABB and a sphere, ABB transform and sphere too, right? Um, you can see that I'm only support transform and sphere. Um, technically, an ABB is a transform too. You can get uh, the transform of the ABB and do it like that. So you. you Maybe I should add like a get transform for this ABB to be a helpful function. But basically, this vector two is how much you need to move and in what which direction. This is a vector, of course. Uh, you need to move the first parameter, in this case, a transform or a sphere, in order to resolve the collision. Meaning that if you move this transform by this amount that gets returned here in, by the resolve collision, this transform will no longer collide with the other. Shape. So this is a very helpful function and it will definitely help you to make your stuff like to resolve your collision. So you can see the engine provides all the basics here for you to create any collision you want. Uh, I do not support mesh collision yet. I plan to add a bounding volume hierarchy. It's hard to pronounce that. BVH <laughs> uh, in the future. So keep that in mind. So yes, that's basically the physics here. So now we know the the audio we know math and we know physics now it's time to jump with the more interest uh by the way i will not gonna go into details about the scripting because the scripting as you can see is very simple actually um everything you need to know probably is this the interpreter uh i haven't implemented the other stuff yet so i will improve the scripting later on but basically in order to run the script a python script uh, and it is automatically reflected like it automatically reflects the entire uh Genome api so everything you need to do is create an interpreter class and then you need to run the code very simple like that or you can compile this store the compiler code and then run it like that uh, if you're only doing this once, it's the same as running the, the code directly using this function, by the way. So let me go and, and show you a quick example of this to so know what I'm talking about. So this here, uh, I, I'm basically creating a Python interpreter here called script, and then I'm doing script.run and I'm passing a Python script and it will work. You can see two lines of code. You can access Python scripting with your project very easily and it to have every single function that I'm mentioning here um, listed automatic right so this is a script now let's move to the system and i will leave the graphics last because you can do a lot of stuff you with the system before needing the graphics let me check the quick check the youtubes um the system youtubes here just do have some easy functions to help you do stuff for example we can get the game path the get the game path will return basically the the folder that the executable is located at which is very handy for you. Uh, maybe, for example, when I'm playing this game using Visual Studio, the path that I, it uses, that the project will use by default, if I, for example, try to open an image without passing the full path, will be the solution path, not where the executable is. It, it actually, I believe it will be the editor path, not the solution path. So it's good to have like the game path here, and it does have this YouTube function, function for you to do. Um, get sys font you will see in a moment that you can create fonts here in cave so this is a way to get like for example let's say i want to have windows arial font 
um, or Times New Roman or stuff like that. I can use this to get a path for the font in the system, which is very handy because that way you can make games and do not you don't need to worry about shipping uh, an existing font. You can use a, a system font, right? Uh, this is a, another YouTube function to convert a wide string which is this, to normal, normal string, which is this. So again, very simple stuff. This list will probably grow with time, but for now I do have the YouTubes. And now let's jump to the cool stuff, right? The first cool stuff is the window class, uh, that basically if you create a window, it as the name suggests, create a window for you. You can pass a title, a width, and a height. You can also set another title later on using the set and get title very easily. And of course you have everything that you can expect from a window. Functions to see, to close the windows, to see if the window is open or closed. Um, functions to set to, to set the position or the size, or to get the position or the, the size, width and height, right? Um, you can know the drawable width and height of the, the window. And by the way, the difference here is like, if you get the width itself versus the drawable width and height, if you don't know, basically the width is probably, because there's like a, a shadow here, all that, and the height is also probably all that. And the drawable width and height, uh, no, this is the width, <laughs> sorry, and this is the height, it was a typo, a spelling mistake, not a spelling, a speaking mistake, anyways, and this is the drawable height. It's only this part. And the same thing goes for the drawable width. It's only the part that actually gets drawn in the in the window. So it does not consider the, the header and all that for the window. So this is the difference, right? You can set the mode. If you want to toggle uh, maximize or full screen, you can do this by this. Uh, you can enable or disable vSync. And this is the internal only. I probably I will probably delete this anyway. And last but not least, we have swap buffers because if you're doing um, a game and you want to handle stuff to the screen it does have double buffering and then you need to call this every frame basically to swap the buffers so the buffers that you were drawing will actually appear on screen so that's why this function exists so very simple and straightforward and it will open a window for you let's move on um i have events event is good let me do let me talk about that uh later because if you want to handle keyboard inputs or mouse inputs everything you need to do is create an event class in your program and then you need to update it every single frame so it fetches the the data the, the up-to-date data and also to do this you can see with those three very simple functions if you press the key if the key is active meaning that you are holding the key or if you just release the key and how to access those keys well that's why you have the event types here that basically you can do event and the key name and you can see that we do have all the keys also all the letters here you also have numbers you have delete insert space and everything here uh named for you so you can just look up here get your key and so on you also have mouse mouse left middle and right so this is good to know too and i'll probably add i'll actually go and add to my to-do list uh an option for you to get like the the mouse wheel and so on all right and last but not least in order to finish the system we do have a timer timer is very simple it just counts times in, in second so if you create it it will start counting and every time you do get the timer um it will return them the amount of time elapsed since you started the timer in second you can also reset the timer to start over and set it um to like an initial time period so very useful if you're making games it's very good to have a timer to have accurate time measurement and you can do it like that very easily with this engine right uh, we also have clock the, the whole point of a clock is to make sure that your game ticks at a specific frame rate right um it works okay at the time to be honest but um you can do this and this is inspired by pi game let me see if i have an example here i probably have in the editor so i have a clock here and what i do is i tick this with the target frames per second which is 60 and it will make sure that the game runs at 60 frames per second and it will pass a delta for me to use all the way across my game so that's basically the clock the clock now we finish the other another uh, folder and the last folder that we need to cover is the graphic. And the graphics is straightforward. Uh, basically, once you have the window created, it's important to have the window created. Let me go to my test in, in Python because it's easier to show you. So I have a window created here, this, 
and then I have the event created here and I'm updating the event and in the end of every frame I'm swapping the buffer by the way uh, the API is exactly the same as as the API in C++ but the difference is that in Python we start each uh, function with a lowercase while in C++ it's uppercase and this is this change is just make sure that we do um, keep uh, like a naming convention here because Python we used to do this like start this with lowercase uh, Python actually use uh, snake case but I'm really don't like snake case so that's why I'm keeping the camel case but um, we start with a lowercase for methods. Okay, so this is the only difference. So you know, if you want to do something in Python here, you know that you can use the same API, except that it starts with lowercase. Anyways, so once you do this, once you have a window, you you update the event, you check if, if the window is closed, so you can stop the game loop, and you can swap buffers in the middle here, drawing those here. Great, right? Um, so now we can know you can understand how to draw stuff on screen. The very first thing that I'll show is the graphics because the graphics is a YouTube function. Um, the first thing you need to do if you want to draw something is to set the, the drawing target here. So you do graphics, uh, set target, and then you can pass an image to draw something into an image, which is very handy, or you can pass a window to draw something into a window. So if I want to draw uh, my game into the screen, I want to set target to screen. And I probably do this Right here, you can see graphics set target window. Great, right. let's continue. The last, the, the, the next, next thing you want to do, um, this is probably when you initialize your project, is if you want to enable or disable alpha blending. If you disable this, it will not going to blend uh, if you have transparent textures. Um, and if you enable this, it will blend and transparency will work. So we need to enable this. And uh, But you can do this outside the main loop, by the way. And then once you set the target you can clear um, the color of this that it will basically fill the entire texture or the window with uh, color and you can pass this both passing rgba the range here is zero to one or you can pass a color class what is this color class well let's go ahead in the graphics color and see it's actually a struct color struct color and it does have rgba the difference here is this um, assigned char because this means that this will be ranging from 0 to 255, so this is the range of each color, uh, so you know. I might add some constructors here, I'll actually go and add to my to-do list here to add this, but this is a very simple struct and it will definitely help you to make your games, right? So now that you know the graphics and the color, what's next, what is necessary to, to handle something? We actually need, uh, I'll actually go ahead and explore everything here, the font last, but Let's go to the image. I think it will be interesting to see the image now that you have the color. Because what if you have a set of colors? Maybe you have an image and this is the class that you're looking for. Um, you can create an image by basically loading the, them from disk so you can pass the file path. Or you can create an empty image with a specific width, height, and you can also define if they are pixelated or not. A pixelated image is, you can see this is a pixel art. And if I zoom in, they're not blurry, right? So exactly how you, as you as you expect. If I pass false here, it will be blurred because uh, it will do some interpolations. That does not work for pixel art. That's why I have this. And I have this true by default because the main tension here is to make the um, 2D pixel art game, pixel art games. So this is why I have it true. But it can disable, of course. I can copy an image. And then I have all sorts of functions to help me. For example, I can get a pixel or I can set a pixel or I can set all the pixels passing a vector of colors. Um, in the set pixel, we will have the X and Y position of the pixel. Anyways, uh, I can append an image into another image, which is very interesting. Um, it will only work if this other image is uh, have a smaller size than the, the image in question. And if it fits, in the X and Y, otherwise it will throw, it will search something. Uh, we can get width, height, we can resize the image. We can see if it's pixelated or set, it to be pixelated. Um, you can split the image. This is very interesting. If you have like uh, a tile set and if you want to split this image into multiple different images, one each per tile, you can use split image, uh, passing the number of tiles in the X axis and the number of tiles in the Y axis. And it will return a vector for you for all, with all the images split. Very nice, right? 
Um, you can also read from GPU because if you're drawing something uh, directly via, via the GPU, the if you get the pixels later on, it will be wrong. So we need to read back from the GPU, right? Um, and if you do some changes in the in the CPU, for example, if you set a bunch of pixels, it will not going to reflect the GPU until you submit data. So it's important to know that submit is here and it is used for that. So yeah, this is for image handling and it does everything for you. Very easy very simple so let's move on um talking about image we do have the phone that is basically a super image uh it, it, it takes a, a file path i'm not gonna go into a lot of details in the phone because it can be a little bit complicated and i'll make sure to have an example or something like that for you to understand but it takes a file path to a tts a tts i believe it's the the file format for the for a font and it will load this font and it will build an atlas and I, well, the reason why I said that this atlas looks like an image is because it is literally an image with all the characters in the phone, right? And the the good thing that you need to know here about phone is that you can use it, and then you can handle this, can handle a specific test, uh, text, and it will return basically uh, a mesh for this text. It's a bit complicated, so don't worry much about the font. It's better to look at an example. So I'll make sure to provide an example, but know that we do have a font class and it works, right? So let me move on. Sorry for the bad explanation for the font, but I believe it's best to have an example. Let's move to the mesh because the mesh is very interesting too. Um, basically a mesh is for 2D meshes at the moment. <laughs> so we have a vertex structure with a position and a an UV, UV mesh. And as you can expect, you can constru construct an empty mesh and then you can add the vertices here as you wish and the indices. The indices represents a triangle. Each three uh, indices here is one triangle and it is basically mapping to the array of vertices. So that's basically what is the indices, right? Um, you can append another mesh or add another mesh into this mesh to merge two meshes to, together or you can append a plane, a given plane to a position or a transform which is very handy. So if you want to do something like that, if you want to concatenate two meshes you can do, if you want to do it yourself you can basically modify the vertices and indices um, structures here. Uh, you can clear the mesh to delete everything in it, you can use the mesh in order to draw it, you can draw the mesh itself and you can submit the data to the GPU because if you change the vertices, the indices or if you append something to it it will not exactly submit to the GPU, so I need to do this, right? So very simple stuff for you to handle meshes, 2D meshes at the moment. Uh, let's see what else here. I have the shader, we are reaching the end here, good. Um, the shader is also very simple, uh, you can construct it, and if you don't pass anything, it will pass, it will use a default vertex and a default fragment shader. Let me show you real quick what they are look, uh, how they look. You can see, very simple, takes a position and an UV and outputs um, a new V takes a transform as an uniform and it is doing basic math here. Simple stuff if you know OpenGL. So yeah, if you don't know, you probably don't need to mess around with them. It will work for most basic use cases. Uh, and I may expand this to allow tint, for example, so you don't have to modify the, cha the shader every time when it tint. Um, a, a sprite, so yeah. And uh, the fragment shader, again, is also very, very simple. Go back. And of course, you can use a shader to draw it. You can submit. So if you made changes to the vertex and the fragment shader here, and you can change them uh, right here, you can submit this to the GPU. And of course, you have a bunch of functions here of methods to set uniform. So you have a uniform name, and then you have the value of, of it. So you have integer flow, you have vector 2D, vector 3D, vector 4D, and you also have like the Dion Dynami data types here, matrix tree, and, and so on. So very easy here. And of course, this is the shader class. Simple like that. There's nothing super complicated here. Simple stuff for you to use and make game. And last but not least, you have the tile map. Um, a tile map is basically like a structure that I created for you to paint a bunch of tiles together. Let's say you want to make a map with a bunch of images. Uh, it is very slow to draw every single tile of a tile map one by one. So I do have this tile map here ready for you. So you create a tile map and then you go ahead and append here um, tiles. I don't even have YouTube's functions because it's not necessary. Um, and each tile is a transform in an image. 
So that's basically it uh, in, the, in the tile, right? Uh, and then if you submit this, it will basically create a giant mesh and a giant image to draw the entire tile map in a single draw call, which is way faster than drawing everything uh, one by one. Again, I will make sure to add a, a sample code for this, but it is very simple. It is literally create a tile map, add the tiles, submit, and then in order to draw, use and draw it. Very simple, very straightforward. So let me end this video by showing you, it's a little bit of a mess. So I will actually split this. Once I have an example, I will show you how to draw stuff. But again, let me summarize here. You set the target, for example, the window. You clear the, the color. I'm clearly this to red, green, blue to be blue. Um, you first use the shader. And then you set the uniforms you want. I'm setting the, the image and the transform here. Um, and then you can use the mesh. In this case, I'm using the, the tile map and the image. So if you're not drawing a tile map, you need to use to, to call use for both the mesh and the image. It's important. Um, and then everything you need to do is draw the mesh. So you can see here below that I'm using a tile, an image here a mesh and then I'm drawing. And that's basically it. This is literally how to draw stuff. It's a bit of a mess again, but I will show some clear examples later on. And last but not least, you saw buffers and you're ready to go. Very simple, very straightforward. So folks, this is a long video, but this is the entire API. And remember, this is uh, this part is available on my Patreon. So if you're watching this and if you're interested, if you like the library, um, consider checking that out. By the way, this is very lightweight. I'm not relying on any expensive third-party libraries. I have some very basic ones and you will get access in the Patreon to the entire source code, not the, just the include in the lib folder files. You have everything for you to study, right? So that's it for this video, folks. I hope you enjoy it and I see you in the next video. Bye.